Ryan, when we look at this, I, I mean, earlier today, the S&P 500 moved into positive territory for the year. So what's your take maybe on how uh, earnings sets up an interesting risk reward situation here as we get further and further into earnings season? Yeah, you just mentioned last week, I and mean, it was a small litmus test of what's going to happen. But man, that's a pretty big beat across the board. And I realize earnings right now are all across the board, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to really discern what those Q2 earnings are going to look like. But, you know, our thesis has been that, look, the economic data has come out better than expected now for over a month, right? Any big piece of economic data that's come out, like retail sales last week, again, up another 7.5%. We're back to literally you know, pre-pandemic levels, Zach, that's like, it's incredible. Um, so I have to think that's going to continue to bleed over to earnings as well. And, you know, we saw that last week. I mean, the banks absolutely, you know, for the most part, uh, there are a couple of culprits there, uh, you know, beat better than expectations on the earnings side. But what I like as well is, you know, they put another like $36 billion into reserves when you look at the big banks. And my guess is they're probably not going to need that whole $36 billion. So at some point that money comes back on the balance sheet as profit, so I think that lines up Q3 and Q4 for very good earnings. So I think if we can beat ex expectations this quarter, which I think you will, and then you start to see some really good numbers, Q3 and Q4, um, they could be big catalysts coming into the end of the year here. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting you talk about Q3 because we've seen expectations come down a bit there when we think about the economic strength. At least Goldman uh, recently, about two weeks ago, cut their Q3 GDP forecast as we kind of saw some of these case counts rising in those worrying states, and they noted that the potential here could be for that uh, reopening of the economy across the country could reverse or at least slow down. So what do you think about that downside risk moving forward as it still potentially hangs over uh, that bounce back you're talking about in Q3, Q4? Well, this is why I love economists, because they're always just a little too negative. Um, and we've seen that so far this year, right? I mean, it's just amazing how much better the data was. And I think we talked about this before uh, than what economists thought. And they have like all the information in the world and they still get it wrong. So, you know, I think is, yeah, I always look at the market, it's forward looking. And I think when you think about stocks right now is, look, it, it wasn't a secret. We knew that we weren't going to just turn a switch back on and all of a sudden the economy was going to turn right back on. So I don't think it's been a secret that we were going to have fits and starts and I think you are going to see that going into the fall. It's obvious, like you said, we're getting some, you know, so we're getting some closing downs of different states, or they're they're going back on pushing back on where they were. Like Florida, Texas are two good examples of that. But I think it's kind of interesting. Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America, said last week, even though spending is dialed back a little bit, it's still well above where it was back in March when we we're in the di most dire part of this, you know, this pandemic. So my, I suspect here. You know, first off, I think the market cares about things are getting better. And I suspect things will continue to get better, even if we have fits and starts here, which I think we'll see. And the other thing, I th and we talked about this last time, too, is where is money going to go? I mean, there's so much money sitting in cash earning nothing right now. And I'm really paying attention to the Fed. Jay Powell said he's going to keep rates low for like another 24 months. So, you know, as the economy slowly gets better and all this cash that sits there on the sidelines, I think it's going to just keep seeping to the market here, Zach. Plans out of D.C. for potentially more than another trillion dollars in terms of relief here. Do you think that that's really, I guess, the catalyst if you're an investor looking at this and saying, all right, the S&P 500 is back in the green for the year? As astonishing as that is, you still have more relief potentially coming down the pike. So is that really the next catalyst you see here that could push the market higher? I suspect that's priced in already because I think it's kind of bipartisan, uh, you know, big financial largesse. <laughs> I think both the Democrats and Republicans seem to agree with that. With, there's no problem there. We're happy to spend money. Um, so I think profit, I think really earnings are where the focus is here. And I think, again, last week was a great, great start. And I suspect you're going to see more of earnings in the positive. And also just looking globally right now, I mean, look, I mean, China at this point, and you know, a lot of economic, economic data is already back to pre-pandemic levels. I mean, you look at industrial production going up. Um, I look at copper. That's just a great barometer for you know, what's going on in the global economy. And that's already back to prices that was pre-pandemic pre levels as well. So I think that also that global economy as a catalyst here, too. Like, don't discount Europe. Don't discount the emerging markets. They've got great valuations right now. I know for our clients, we're definitely diversifying overseas. Don't just put your money into tech and large cap growth here. We know it's been the hottest sector. If you're giving advice to investors out there, would it be more kind of uh, diversifying the portfolio here to take advantage of some of those names that haven't seen everything come back completely yet versus a mix of some of these tech stocks? And you think about Tesla, one of those companies out there that hasn't necessarily downgraded their forecast from where they were entering the year 
in thinking about uh, deliveries, uh, it's an astonishing thing to think about. But what would you say is the right way to play this as we move forward to the back half of 2020? Yeah, I think the important thing here is, look, tech is getting overvalued. Um, if you go back to you know, 99, 2000, and you have a tech bubble burst, things can get irrational for a very, very long time. So I think you want to have your money exposure there. But you know, right now, you've got the rest of the market at a relative discount. And if you look at the spread between growth stocks and value stocks right now, it's the largest spread like ever, from like every metric ever. So if you're an investor thinking, ah, oh, market's already back to the high, I don't want to invest here. Well, if you start to segregate the market down to value, we just talked about international. Uh, we start looking at the emerging markets. You know, you've got great value here that if you can just start buying those other asset classes like we do for our clients, you're getting like some of the best value you're ever going to get in your lifetime. So, you know, but still have some of those tech names in there. That stuff can keep running. Amazon at 130 times earnings earnings. I don't think it's a great deal, but if it keeps moving here, you want to participate in that part of the market as well. But you got to diversify your money here and you're getting one of the best opportunities ever.